What does it mean to be autistic, and how can you recognize the signs of autism in your child? Find out right now on Keeping Kids Healthy. Hello, I'm Dr. Winnie King, and I'm here with some leading autism specialists in the lobby of the Children's Hospital at Montefiore, New York City. So you may hear some noise in the background. If you've ever seen the movie Rain Man with Dustin Hoffman, you've seen the kind of repetitive behaviors and unusual speech patterns that can characterize autism. But Rain Man was a work of fiction. For many families, autism in a child is a very real and life-changing disorder as parents watch their child retreat into his own world. Meet the Lyle family whose son Brendan was diagnosed with autism at 26 months of age. Want to do Mickey's letter time? Mm -hmm. I can eat the You want to go to Nick Jr.? Okay. Mm -hmm. Sing Lale Chusa, yeah. From a very early age, Brennan had many ear infections. So we thought when he wasn't talking at a year old, he lost maybe. And then it went on a couple more months and he wasn't walking at that point. He was also... He was slow in developing. Slow in developing that way as well. A couple more months. So now we're starting to get nervous. He's not talking. Parents become worried often around a year, year and a half when the child isn't talking. And they realized there were other things about the child that may have been odd, a funny combination often of the child having seemed too good in some ways, but then having odd little responses that become much more noticeable as the child gets older. In our old house, we had a, um, like a picket fence, and he would run next to the picket fence, look out of the corner of his eye, and he'd get this flashing and strobe effect. Autism is a complicated neurodevelopmental disorder. It affects multiple areas of development, the child's social development, their language and communication, and also their behavior. Okay, let's take a break. Let's take a break from computer. The child may be interested, for example, in doing something over and over and over and over and over again. The kind of thing that would bore most of us to death. The child with autism likes to do. More? Yeah. Want more? Yeah. Good boy, B. More, How about a yellow? Oh, play. put a yellow on top. Ah. Brendan was diagnosed in October, okay, and I was pregnant with Haley. So she was only a couple months old when he was first diagnosed with autism. Autism is probably one of the most strongly genetic disorders. Uh, interestingly, I've seen families with sometimes four and five children, all with autism. With Haley, we were going down that road like she's typical. She's great, all yeah. of a sudden, after one, it was like a weekend isolation. Ooh, another hat. 51 weeks after Brendan was diagnosed, Haley was diagnosed. It was like something you read in a book that you can't believe could happen to somebody. We, this little girl who used to greet you every morning when you picked her up out of her crib, hi, and mommy and daddy all of a sudden said nothing. For children um, who have a disability of any kind, it can sometimes be very stressful for parents. But parents will also find joys and sometimes wonderful opportunities for pleasure. Good girl. <laughs> the joy or the happiness is with them. Uh, being with them because they they learn a new talent they they learn a new sound and it's huge. it smiles it's like we talked about appreciating the real small things you know they're surprised hey I did this and I can do that they're funny they have little senses sense of, humor. of humor they have personality they're our life jump 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 yeah Pam what were those first few months like after Brendan was diagnosed. Well, it definitely felt as if someone had just really punched me in the stomach. It was very upsetting, hard to describe, and I saw it as a type of grieving. It started out with denial. This is something that will not last. It went on to isolation. We just didn't know what to say to people. We kind of closed ourselves off. We got to acceptance, and we, we've accepted it ever since. 
but on occasion we go back to those first That's stages. Feelings. Why us? Mm -hmm. um, why us? Mm -hmm. And um, but we, we're in acceptance, and we, we definitely have moved forward since. Yeah. Where Dr. Ami Klin and Dr. Kasia Harvaska are here from the Yale Child Study Center, where Pam and Chris went to get help. And uh, let's let's start with you, uh, Ami. What what exactly is autism, and what are the characteristics? Autism is a developmental disorder that impacts on a child's ability to intuit other people's feelings, to read other people's minds, to engage others, to develop relationships. It affects the child's ability to develop speech, language, communication, sharing experiences, and also a lot of behavioral peculiarities like doing the same thing over and over and over again. The repetitive behaviors just over and over. Indeed, a change is not really the spice of life for our children, and yet in life, almost uh, nothing repeats itself. So life is this a uh, constant challenge. And uh, when do we typically see these changes? Uh, well, uh, children, uh, uh, children basically face change at every moment in their lives. Nothing repeats itself in the same way. A mother is taking the child to school and they are fixing the road, taking another route. Well, that's a big challenge. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the thing that changes the most is actually people. And the four people can be extraordinarily perplexing to our children. But typically parents will start to notice these changes around the age of three? Um, actually, um, nowadays we are, um, we are identifying uh, sort of signs of autism at a much earlier age than three. But certainly by the time of the age of, th of, the age of three, uh, we're saying this. And is there a connection with this in IQ? That's the big concern parents have. Indeed. Uh, in fact, individuals with autism have IQ across the entire spectrum. Individuals who are profoundly mentally retarded and individuals who actually have IQs that are higher than yours or mine. Mm -hmm. Very gifted children. Well, Tasha, we saw with the Lyles that they, they sensed something was wrong, but they just couldn't quite put their finger on it, you know, and that's what can be so frustrating and frightening for parents. What are some of the signs that parents should be looking for? There are several signs in the second year of life that should be concerning. Uh, if a child does not make eye contact very frequently, if the child is not interested in other people, if the child does not respond when their name is called, if they have difficulties developing speech, parents do not hear babbling, and also when they don't, do not develop gesture as a way of communication. They don't point. In particular gestures which can indicate what they're interested in, like gesture, or, or like pointing or, or showing. Yeah. Is there a test that we can do for autism that gives us the definitive answer, yes or no, it's there or it's not there? Mm -hmm. There's no single medical test we can conduct and decide whether the child has or doesn't have autism. For that reason, we need to conduct a very comprehensive multidisciplinary uh, test which involve cognitive development, social, adaptive skills, motor skills, speech, language, sometimes also a gen genetic and neurological exam. So it's, it's a really complex look at the child from all different angles, not just from one particular point That's of view. Right. That's yeah. right. Well, Ami, you said that uh, autistic children don't read social cues, which all parents with children with autism know exactly what that means. But how important is social interaction to a young child at this point in their lives? There are very few things in life that we do that does not involve a social component. And in fact, um, there are a great deal of important things that the children learn that they actually learn within the context of social interaction. So it has repercussions across all lines of development. So this isn't just that my child is shy and that's why they're so quiet. No, it's actually an inability to intuit other people's feelings, not simply that I process what you're doing and therefore I choose to withdraw. Mm -hmm. It's something that children are not willfully doing. It's something yeah. that they're born with. Well, you know, we're talking about not reading social cues, being sort of turned in on yourself, which sounds, I know, so familiar to you guys. But then the next question becomes, well, as a parent, does this mean I have no relationship with my child? Will they be able to connect with me on any level ever? Absolutely, they will. So, yes, they, uh, children do form relationships with their parents, and you've seen this with uh, the Lyles. Uh, it's a different relationship, however. It's one that is based on proximity. It's based on trust. Uh, probably not the kind of the richness and internalized life that you uh, probably would associate with the relationship with parents and I know children. you've described it as sort of buying a bus ticket to go to one place and 
winding up someplace well, else. in a way, we as parents, whenever we are expecting a child, it's like taking a trip to Italy. We expect that way. It's adventurous, it's colorful and all. And having a child with disabilities is like finding yourself in Holland. Uh, it's not as adventurous, it's not as fascinating, and yet it's beautiful if we just find it in mm -hmm. that way. Yeah. Well, Pam, what has your experience been? You know, um, this, this was tough. I know for both of you and you, you mentioned about the denial and about yeah. sort of coming to a place of acceptance. How has that whole relationship between your children played out differently between Brendan and Haley? Very much differently. Um, being my first child, at first I thought the bond between Brendan and I was, was typical, but it wasn't. When I looked back, he was, uh, didn't wrap his arms around me like you think your little baby's going to do. But it was pretty much even keel. And after he was diagnosed, we stepped in and it's, it's been very good, uh, steadily increasing ever since his socialization skills. With Haley, it was a little more of a roller coaster ride. We started off great. Like I said, um, she was typically developing. And at about a year old, we saw her dwindle down, downward and uh, she didn't need us at all. She really didn't seem to want to socialize. That would seem more hurtful bond. almost because you had something going with her and then all of a sudden, it, like a switch as you described it, it changed. Yeah, and the, and the bells and the whistles just went off you know, in our minds saying, oh my God, yeah. we've Such just familiar. come down that road, um, but luckily we knew where to go. Yeah. And it, it was like getting to know a, a new child. All and over we're on again. an upward trend. Yes. That's great. Yeah. Well, once a child with autism turns three, the law requires that they be offered therapy in a school. The League Treatment Center in Brooklyn, New York, is the oldest day treatment program in the U.S. We spent a day there with a delightful former student and learned how these schools can help kids with autism. Autistic children are easily overwhelmed by sights and sounds that are normal for most kids. It's called sensory overload. By learning to recognize different sensations, the overload can be managed. This is the way we brush your Finger painting can teach body awareness. Away! Away! And rolling or jumping can have a calming effect. Three. Taylor, are you having fun? Yes. <laughs> In the classroom, autistic children can learn to master the world around them to prepare them for a more challenging social world outside. Flowers grow in a garden, a rainbow on the ground. For James Ogilvie, his learning curve was long but well worth it. He entered the League Treatment Center when he was three. I had gone to a regular nursery school, and after doing some testing on me, they told me. My mom, hey, your kid needs the kind of support that a special ed nursery environment can bring him. I had speech problems, I had problems with relating to motor skills and eye-hand coordination. I was very sensitive to noise. I'd get really upset when motorcycles would whiz by. I would have trouble making eye contact because I would be in my own thoughts. I wouldn't be concentrating at the moment on what I was doing and what the person was saying. So I would look down like this, the person saying, hey, James, could you do something for me? And I would just like go, okay. And I wouldn't look up like this. Nice oh to meet you, Nancy. Yeah, nice to meet you too. I wouldn't be so much the way I am now, really outgoing. It used to be very difficult. I used to be really shy. Hi, Laura. Nice to meet you. Right. Love it was learning self-control, fo folding your hands. And even today, sometimes when I'm sitting on the bus, I still do this. Folding my hands, because I used to have a habit. When I get really excited, I would wave my hands around a lot and they tried to control that and it, it worked. Ah. Empathy is the key to understanding a condition which people are, are born with and they can't help it that they're born with it. We're determined enough and work hard enough to 
meet our goals and are goal-oriented, that we'll try our best to live up to our potential and our expectations. Probably not always other people's expectations, because whether you have autism or not, you can't please everybody. <laughs> you know? The goals you set, that should make you happy, and that's what should make others happy. James and his mom, Ellen, are here with us now. And James, you're in college. Yeah, it's great to be there. Yay! To be what are you there. studying? I'm studying um, American Studies. It's an interdisciplinary program, art, music, sociology, etc. It doesn't only focus on one discipline. It's breadth rather than depth, but it combines my interests and skills and history and media and so forth. That's fantastic. Now, what types of obstacles have you tried to or you've had to overcome as you've pursued your career in, in school? Okay. Um, having to overcome the um, adjusting to the, the size of the environment and the amount of people on the environment. Because before college, my whole life, I was in insulated environments with big support amount of support and a small amount of people. So now it was a small amount of support and a bigger group of people. Yeah. So that's a different, that's a totally different environment for you. Right. But it sounds like you're doing great in that environment. Yeah. Have you had to advocate for yourself though? Yeah, I, I gradually learned how to do that. Well, just before I went to college, I learned how you know, you have to fight your own battles. You have to be not passive or aggressive, but assertive. Say, Professor so-and-so, I need this and this and this. I need to take my test here, and I need this accommodation, and so And forth. so test taking has been something that you've had to have some special provisions made for. Right. And I learned about what my rights were under ADA and oh good for you sort of and so you know to stand up for yourself yeah I know you must be so proud listening proud. to your son you know talk about not only his interest in college and what he wants to do in life but that he knows what he needs to fight for so that he can achieve those goals you know how have you seen him grow over time well I think I think James is now it's very obvious that the symptoms that he had when he was much younger have greatly improved and he he perseveres and he works very hard and he's very brave to try to keep things going and one thing that's that's difficult in a way now it's almost like as if his disability is is um, is growing milder growing milder but that's also that's obvious right yeah but people wouldn't, get, wouldn't guess that I have any disability now and they talk to me because I'm say, oh I'm so articulate. And that's great, isn't that nice to have somebody say that to you? Yeah. But I know that, great. Ellen, you had said at one time that a doctor had told you that your child would never have a conversation. When, when James was uh, very young and we first uh, had visited a neurologist, the neurologist thought that James would never be able to speak a normal conversation. Or go to and college. Or go it, to college and, and look at you now, right? Mm -hmm. Well, Kasha, you know, this is where those social training skills can make such a big difference. Tell us about that. That's right, especially when they begin uh, so early in development. Uh, and for young children, it begins really with tolerating proximity of other kids, paying attention to what other children are doing, uh, and then gradually joining in play. For somewhat older children, it could be how to converse with another person, how to introduce yourself, mm -hmm. how to uh, decide how close you're going to stand, how close is too close, how far is too far, uh, what kind of topic to choose and not to monopolize the conversation. So these are the things typically developing children learn naturally. And these children just need a little extra help. They need an extra help and they need to be taught. Well, James, I've had the opportunity to speak with some adults who were diagnosed with autism as children, and I've asked them, you know, what, what's it like? You know, what's going on in your mind? And what they've told me is that it feels sometimes as if the world is too loud, that they just want to just turn the volume down. Everything is just too loud. What, is that what it's like for you? Well, um, 
to a greater extent, that's what it was like when I was four or five. It was sort of a case of too much stim overstimulated environments, whether I would be in a playground with a lot of children that I didn't know, and I would get very frightened and upset. Mm -hmm. Lots of children around, loud noises like motorcycles whizzing by, and I would cry. And, and when you find that there's too much going on, at a given moment, too much noise, what do you do? How do you make oh, it work well, for you? Let's say I'm in a, a restaurant and there's a lot of people talking, it's very loud and the restaurant's very small. I would turn my head like that just until, make, until the sound dies down and then I would come back to where I was. It's a way to just um, refocus, escape the overstimulation and then come back to normal. Yeah, just sort of... It's a coping mechanism. Absolutely, and it, and it, and it works. Yeah. Uh, you know, we visited the Child Study Center at Yale to take a first-hand look at their autism research and to see what they're learning about the differences between children with and without autism. The first thing to do is to place the eye-tracking device over the subject's head, which tells us exactly where the person is looking at at every moment in time. We have multiple scenes, from playing peekaboo and showing a little teddy bear. What we have been observing is that uh, typical children tend to focus a tremendous amount of their time focusing on people's eyes. So they find eyes fascinating, and probably because they find that the eyes convey a great deal about what's going on in people's minds, in people's hearts for that matter. Whereas um, uh, the children with autism that we've been studying in this lab, uh, many of them tend to focus on people's mouths rather than people's eyes. Why the mouth? Well, many possibilities. We don't have a final answer right now, but one of the possibilities is that uh, the mouth is where the speech comes from. And for some of our children who um, have more difficulty understanding non-verbal cues, facial expressions, bodily gestures, they may focus on something that they do understand, which is language. Watch me. You do. You do Haley's turn. That's right. <laughs> Very good. Ribbit. Wonderful. Yeah, she's doing very well. She really is saying more and more words. Ribbit, ribbit, ribbit. It's a stage. Yeah. Starts with commenting it's and then, then absolutely. That's right. That's right. Our feeling is that um, if we focus on the skills that allow children to engage others, we might be able to see the breakdown of those skills at a much earlier stage. I mean, are there actual differences in the brains of children with autism? Yes, there are, and um, those differences are more in function than in structure. However, we all need to know that the brain does not simply determine what you're going to be in life. Uh, the brain is also a repository of experiences, and in the first years of life, the brain is very malleable. So our hope is that due to this neuroplasticity, that we might actually be able to change the experiences that our children go through, and in this way, make a dent into the natural course of the condition, and in that way, to change brain function as well. All the more reason for the early intervention because Indeed. the brain can change. Absolutely. Well, Pam and Chris, you've seen changes, you know, in your in your children. Um, can you describe those changes since the time they were diagnosed and they've started getting treatment? No, with Brendan, he had no vocabulary. He was grunting and he had this constant drool coming out of his mouth because he had very low muscle tone. Uh, we got involved with a state-run agency in Connecticut called Birth to Three. They came to our house and provided in-home therapy. Uh, and we went from uh, grunting and drooling to a picture exchange system where Brendan would pick pictures. Uh, we went to sign language classes, and now Brendan can speak. So yeah, then with Haley, uh, we were able to get her out of her isolation by finding physical activities that she enjoyed doing, the trampoline, um, gymnastics, and that has really made strides with her. You know, it, 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 it's not lost on me that you're here with your wife to talk about autism in your children. And I know this must be so difficult for you to, um, to talk about it. I'm so grateful that you're here because I know that there's so many people that are gonna benefit from it. But what do you want people to know about this? There are parents out there that, um, that people don't quite understand. What, what is it that, from a parent's perspective, you want people to know about it? Early intervention. Uh, I don't know if my son would be speaking now if, if we didn't start back when he was two. And I think even 
as we were in a little bit of denial, we said, let's just go with the diagnosis, get him the help he needs, and if, if it's not true, then that's great. But we need to help them. We need them. to get involved. We, need we to know. definitely need to be involved. And early. James, you are clearly a very special young man, and we're, we're glad that you're here. And you've done a lot. You've come a long way. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot that you're going to go through in life down the future. What do you want people to know about you and about autism? Okay, well, that um, I think people like myself and people with different ranges of autism. Uh, that we're not, um, we don't have to be thought of as victims. We're able to lead independent, fulfilling lives if we just have the support. Yeah. It's not, so, not something wrong with us. We're just different. Yeah, that's right. Now, if you'd like to learn more about autism, I want you to contact the Autism Society of America at autismsociety.org. And their phone number is 800-3-AUTISM. You can also contact Cure Autism Now, and their website is canfoundation.org. Their phone number is 888-8-AUTISM. And I want to thank all of you for being here on the show today and sharing your stories. It means so much to us, and we will see you next time on Keeping Kids Healthy. For more on today's topics, visit KeepingKidsHealthy.org.